Next on the program, we've got Dave France, and uh, Dave is our extension soil and fertilizer specialist on uh, NDSU. He started his career at NDSU in 1994, I believe. That's right. And previously was in the private fertilizer industry business in Illinois. Uh, Dr. France today is going to talk on corn plant nutrition. Give us an update. I didn't see anybody nodding off, but it's, uh, it's going to take a lot of, uh, a lot of willpower here, but you, you, you can do this. Okay. So, so I was asked to talk about a little bit on the plant analysis too, so I'm going to fly through some of these and just make a comment or two as we go along. So we're flying, we're flying, okay, so so where where do these things uh, come from? There's a, I, I think having people get in the habit of taking tissue analysis is probably a good thing, but you need to understand where these things come from. Uh, Sig Milstead uh, is a, was a professor at uh, Illinois and uh, grew up in North Dakota and was on Omaha Beach on D-Day and after he got out of the army, after going all the way to Germany with whatever division he was in, uh, he's, he went to the uh, University of Illinois and, and he was a soil scientist when I was doing my master's in 75, 76 and uh, ended his career here in North Dakota before he passed away. Illinois doesn't have more on issues, <coughs> manganese issues, iron issues, copper issues, they only have zinc issues, they don't have calcium issues, they don't have magnesium issues. But yet, we're tasked as soil scientists to put a number on this list. So where do those come from? I mean, for all I know, they probably came from Turkey, or maybe they came from India, or maybe they came from Australia, who has every micronutrient deficiency known to man because of the parent material and the age of those soils. Where did these come from? And of course, they came from varieties that were grown back in the 60s, which really don't have a whole lot of relevance to what we're doing right now. And so others have made lists. Um, the latest one is from, from Wisconsin. And they don't have manganese issues, and they seldom have iron issues, and they really don't have copper issues, and they don't have any of these other issues. So where do these come from? Well, they come from Australia, and they come from Turkey, and they come from all the list of countries that I told you before that have these kind of things as a natural type of deficiency. But we're tasked again as soil scientists to put a number on the sheet. And so we do, and then we suffer for it. Because people see this as like the numbers on the temple wall. And so, hey, I got this chart, I can go into the field, I can take a soil sample, and I can compare it to a table which has been reviewed by my marketing people and bumped up a few percent to make sure that we're okay and that we're selling enough micronutrients out of our warehouse and, and this is a really good thing. But I don't think it's a very good thing for a farmer. So what John was talking about, I'm going to go one step further, he was, he was taking a look at it and, and I think taking the plant analysis and the soil analysis at the same time is important, but do it paired within the field. It's unlikely that that whole quarter section that John went into that yellow yellow corn was all yellow. There were probably some green areas in there. So you look in the same variety, you look in the same field, you look at a good area and you compare it to a bad area. You do a compare, compare comparison. Then you have a really good idea of what's going on. So that's that's my comment. These tables, you know, they're not John. They're just, you're meant as a guy. They're not. They're not meant as the chiseled temple wall stuff. But I am going to show you this. Uh, Antonio Mellarino is a very good friend and colleague of mine at Iowa State. He probably has the best set of, of data on phosphate and potassium and responses of corn to that of anybody living or passed away. And he is not a proponent of tissue sampling per se for, for P and K, the most studied nutrients known to man. Those are the relationships between small plant K, small plant P on the top, leaf P concentration, and, and relative corn yield on the on the y-axis. I mean, it's pretty much a scatter diagram. You see some points there on the small P analysis there on the left-hand side, but then you also have the same plant concentration maybe making 90 some percent of possible yield. You know, how is that diagnostic? It's not at all. So, you know, you look at P and K, the most studied nutrients of any in the corn belt, and then you try to make a judgment about copper. 
where, I mean, hardly anybody has some kind of a response on copper unless they're in some kind of 20% organic soil in Michigan. Any of you have 20% organic better soils on your farm that, you know, a little deep bog on the back you grow a quarter section of corn on? All right, so I hope you get my point. Paired samples, same field, good versus bad with the soil sample. That's all you need to know about plant analysis. All right, so I want to review this. Uh, the Corn Council has been very generous uh, between 2010 <coughs> through this year in supporting our work to review the corn nitrogen recommendations. We also have some uh, support from Pioneer Hybrid, and we also have support from the International Plant Nutrition Institute, the old PPI, that's now IPNI, those of you that follow that kind of thing. So uh, I want to share with you my thoughts. These will come out. This coming summer, summer 2014, we'll have, we'll have an interactive uh, web page like we do for the wheat. Those of you that know what our wheat recommendations look like, it'll be the same, same format for corn. Uh, and then we'll also come up with a series of algorithms that I'll describe here in just a little bit uh, to help you with your side dress activities. All right, so this is the recommendation I hate with a passion. It's 1.2 times yield potential, and some of you still say yield goal shape on you. And it's 1.2 yield potential, and then less the soil test nitrate two feet, and then less previous crop credits. And I hate this with passion. And this is why I like it, dislike it so much is that is that here it is, 1.2 times times that. And if you get lucky and you guess your yield right, maybe sometime you're close. But most of the time you're not, and you just kind of forget about that and go on. Uh, but uh, so here's here's what it's what it looks like, but if you didn't put any nitrogen on, I mean, some of you skip, skip some nitrogen, I mean, everybody skips a corner or something like that, you really get zero yield. No, you don't. But on zero N, you know, sometimes it yields as much as the rest of the field. So, and then, you know, sometimes magically it's supposed to just cut off right here, you know, the, the, the linear plateau thing, and it's, it, was, it was made for a different time. We didn't have the statistical tools we had, and people grew 80 bushel corn, and, and nitrogen was eight cents a pound. Of so that was it was for a different time. So we started in 2010, and we've accumulated here in North Dakota with the help of Greg and Jasper and Roger Ashley West, West River and a lot of sites. Myself, and my grad students, we have about 77 sites that we've actually taken the yield uh, since 2010, which is quite remarkable. And then we also talked. Our people in Manitoba uh, know that we were doing this, and so John heard, you know, had his growers uh, badgering him and, and wanted him to do this kind of work, and he says, you know, Franz is doing it just south of the border, just let him do it. But, so we have, uh, but he did give me the nine sites that they've had since 2001, and so we've included them in a data set. They're certainly not any different than what we have. They just strengthen the data set we have. And then also, uh, just a few weeks ago, I received uh, 21 sites, uh, and I think most of those were between 2005 and 2009 from northwest Minnesota. Uh, you know, Crookston, Ada, you know, that area up in there if you're familiar with that. So, so we have 21 sites from there. And uh, again, they didn't partition out from the rest of our data set. They, they act a lot like our data set. So, so uh, I just got uh, a data set from South Dakota, so I'll be including that in. And that'll be the northern tier counties that Ron Gilderman has done recently. So, uh, and, and some of those all can actually have sensor data with them that I'll have to incorporate. So, we have well over 100 site years of data since 2001, and most of them are between 2005 and 2013. So, they're very modern data sets. So, that's what we've got to work with. So, John is always nervous when I talk about this, but he doesn't have to be nervous because, you know, we use the soil test nitrate because it really is an advantage for us to use that. Uh, we uh, cuss it when we get up in the morning, it's 20 below, but our nitrate is still there, so we should be a little bit happy about it in the agronomic sense of the word. So what happens if we look at all that data and we, and we forget about the soil nitrate, and we just look at the end rate that we imposed on those studies alone? So that's what it looks like right there. Take a look at that circle area on the left where we have uh, the zero end rate, and the yields go from about 45 bushel up to about 220. If you go to the higher end rates, it's really not a whole lot different than that. So that, that'd be, that'd be um, uh, pretty depressing if that's all we had. But we have, the, we have the soil nitrate 
uh, data. And we include that into it, it, it doubles the confidence we have in the entire data set, which of course we're not going to do just one recommendation, because that would be too simple and make your life too easy. So, uh, but uh, look at those very low end rates. Instead of having a range from 45 to 220, then it's a more reasonable, it's a more reasonable range. There's certainly some things that we don't know about, but and some differences in soils and regions and all that kind of stuff, but but it makes more sense. So the soil test nitrate to two feet is is very important. And there's a reason we recommend it, not just to keep John and groceries. When I worked with the wheat data, one of the things I found helpful was to divide it out east versus west. Uh, and so we did that. And also it was uh, obvious to me as I went out in these fields and I was working with them, uh, in the wet years, which is most of them except for 2012, uh, that uh, the high clay soils were different than our medium textured soils. And in wheat, we found out that long term no till fields were very different than, reacted very different than what the conventional till fields were. Uh, and so we, we have an opportunity to divide those out with this. If we divide it east and west, these are all the sites uh, east of the Missouri River, and they include the northwest Minnesota data and the southern Manitoba data. So that's, that's what that is. And then if uh, taking out the long-term no-till data, this is, it's, in a, it's just in this little world all by itself. So we have different recommendations for long-term no-till fields. These fields have been and no till uh, certainly more than six years, some of them as much as 30 years. They're, they're just different. They use nitrogen more efficiently, and, uh, and, and so they'll have their own recommendations. These are the high clay soils, mostly the valley things, uh, Fargo's, Hagney's, Bearden's, you know, thing, uh, soils uh, in those categories along with all their, their uh, sisters and brothers. The reason I'm not coming out with new recommendations tomorrow is that there's a lot of thought and tweaking and uh, I tend to be a lumper but I'm not afraid to split and and so thinking about whether we need to segregate tile from untiled and and, uh, and these things is, is something I'm going to spend a lot of time on but this is this is the relationship of the tile uh, high clay sites with corn yield and the orange bird certainly is higher this is something that makes a lot of sense to me, that these are high clay sites. If I divide them up into high productivity and low productivity, and define the high productivity as sites that, that yielded over 160 bushels an acre with one of the treatments, I don't care which one, uh, then, then this, uh, this, this line comes out of that. So these are, these are medium textured, these are high clay sites that exceeded 160 bushels an acre. It tends to be, not always, it's not always, the ones that are tiled. There's some untiled ones there too that have uh, uh, just a little bit better surface drainage maybe or got lucky, I'm not sure what. So that, that's what they are. And these are the ones that yield under 160 bushels an acre. They're generally the same kind of soil types as what we just saw on the previous slide, but they have exceptional drainage problems. These are the, these are the fields, really all the high clay sites because you're never really quite sure. But these are the these are the sites that we're really going to push. I'm really going to push the side dress on. Uh, when you get up here, see, you know, we're up upwards of 400 pounds or so of land per acre. Uh, that's that's not really a rate issue. It really should be down here someplace. Uh, but because of all the nitrogen losses early in the season, that pushes the nitrogen rate that uh, that would get that maximum yield up another 100 150 pounds. So the answer on these, these soils is not rate. The answer on these soils is timing. These are, these are the really productive eastern uh, medium textured sites that have water that approach 250 bushel. We had some really good yielding uh, corn on these sites. Uh, this, includes, um, well, this includes lots of sites. And it's all clustered around that curve, and it, and it seems reasonable to me. So I, I think that 160, we can play with it some more, but I think that 160 is going to be the break between higher productivity and low productivity. I don't think I'm going to have three different, in the, in the wheat, as you recall, I have a high, medium, and low. But nobody wants to grow 80 bushel corn, and not many people grow 80 bushel corn continuously and, and stay growing corn. So it's either above 160 or below 160. I think cutting it in half like that is probably the way I'm going to do it. This is a shocker when I brought this up. You know, I, I did it mostly for the high clay, and I thought, well, I'm just going to look at it with the medium textured soils. And I was really shocked 
this is the kind of this is the kind of relationship that you get. These are medium textured soils that that have yields less than 160. This is the kind of relationship you get in a high clay soil on a wet year. So the medium textured soils have problems too when it comes to like that. So these are these are soils that are sensitive to um, maybe leaching, uh, and certainly denitrification, maybe a combination of both of those, but they have issues too. The answer on these soils is not right, it's timing also. There are a number of, of uh, growers that are extremely successful in their neighborhoods, and why their neighbors don't pick up on this is beyond my comprehension unless they have a better insurance agent. But there's one in particular that's west of Walcott in some sandy soil, kind of a high water table, he's grown corn for a long time. And he just historically side dresses. And in the wet years, I'm thinking, you know, how in the world is he going to do it? But he does it, and the, his neighbor's corn, uh, if it made 30 bushel, it would have been a miracle, and his made 180. Side dressing, the only difference. Amazing. So these soils can really benefit from that as well. So it's nothing to poo poo. My Valley City cooperator, for example, he side dresses all this corn. Don't tell me he can't do this. We go back to the return to the end model. This is uh, what the ag economists call an economic production function. They love it because they teach it in classes, but the soil fertility community that started about 2005 is really the only ag community that actually uses this in practice. It's a combination of what we see in the field as far as the response curve, but it also imposes some economics on it too. And during, what, the last 10 years or so, we've seen uh, end prices from 20 cents to a dollar, and we've seen corn prices in my career below two dollars all the way to, to ten, I think. So we've seen huge ranges in volatility both in corn price and also in nitrogen costs. So it's a disservice not to take that into account when we're talking about, about fertilizer recommendations because, you know, it's your job as a farmer, grower, consultant to get the maximum yield or is it to make the most money on it? You know, put on your businessman hat. Oh, you all tell me that you're businessmen. So, Put on your businessman's hat and figure out why you put on fertilizer. You put on fertilizer to make money, not to make sure that your co-op owner goes to Tahiti or something. You know, it's, it's, it's really to your benefit, really. I think sometimes you have to tell yourself that. All right, so anyway, return, return to the end model. This is what it looks like in the raw form. And what this is, is uh, $3 corn. These are the, this is the array for $3 corn, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's, there's these arrays, and each one of these arrays uh, contains, this is dollar a pound in, 90 cent, 80 cent, 70 cent, 60 cent, all the way down to 20 cent. So each of these is an array. This is, this takes into account with these, in this example, the medium textured sites east of the river. And uh, these take into account all of those, and it takes into account the, that formula that you may have seen and ignored. Formula like this, that formula right there is used to, to uh, take a pound of nitrogen and predict what the yield will be at each pound of nitrogen up to, I think I used 350 or something like that, some ungodly number. So, um, so that's what this is. So the, these, these curves are based on a on the actual response curve, and then we we uh, add, of course, the the yield times the dollars per bushel that you get, then we subtract the cost of the nitrogen that took to achieve that. And so that's all it is, a very simple, simple economic thing. So that's what this is. All of these things are a little bit different, and to simplify it just a little bit, uh, this is $3 corn, $4 corn, $5 corn. This is kind of the neighborhood that we're living with right now. Oh, it doesn't go down below that. I don't think it will. But, and the possibility of it going higher than that is kind of remote, too. So this is the neighborhood that we're going to live with with the next, uh, what, 12 months or something like that, unless something really odd happens. So this middle one here is $4 corn, and $0.40 cent in is this one, this one, let me see, that's $0.20, cent, $0.30, cent, $0.40. Cent. So if you look at this line right here, this curve, uh, and uh, estimate, uh, which I can do using calculus, but I won't do it in front of you because we don't have that much time. But it turns out to be somewhere around 260 pounds of N, and that includes all the nitrogen that we can think of. That includes the previous crop credit, if you do soybeans or peas or something the year before, and it includes the soil test nitrogen to whatever. So whatever credits we have, long-term no-till credit, whatever we're going to have, that, that comes off of that. But that's, that's the peak for that. And notice that if we did go to 
to a three dollar corn, that uh, that same thing would come down here to maybe two twenty or so. The rate is not the same as the corn price goes up or down and the end price goes up and down. Because again, we're trying to maximize your profit, not maximize your yield. High clay soils, these are the arrays for that, and you're kind of looking at about a 260 mark. These are the medium textured sites, uh, about 240 for that one. Uh, so anyway, when these come out, it's going to be, you're going to have a, you're going to have a computer sheet that looks a lot like the wheat. It'll have east versus west. You'll click on whether you have a high clay site or other. Uh, you'll click on whether your history has been high productivity or low productivity. And if you're a long-term no-tiller in the east, you'll click on that. So that'll give you that'll give you the background, all the data uh, in an in a embedded chart that you can't see, but it's there. Uh, and then as you, you click up and down on the dollars per bushel and the cents per, per pound of N, then it'll change the, the nitrogen that you have. And you click on your previous crop, it'll make the adjustment there. Click on your tillage system and make some adjustment there maybe. Uh, and then uh, might be something for organic matter down below, because we do have some sites that are over 6% organic matter, and I think that's important as well. When, when I go through all this data, there are two, there are two sets that, that scream side dress at me. One is the high clay soils which, you know, if you're in the valley area, you deal with those all the time. And then the others are these, are these leachable, problem-type loams, sandy loams, loamy sand-type things that either have leaching issues or they can, because of the landscape and the depressions and all that, they could maybe have some denitrification here in the east as well. And, and rate is not the answer with those things. So side dress is. So how do we figure that side dress rate? Okay, so this is... This is really cool. We know we have losses early in the season, so we're going to split it up. Let's say that our nitrogen rates we need to apply, say, 160 pounds of N, and you put 80 pounds on with a nitrification inhibitor that works at a pre-plant, then you figure it on 80. But then you get whole loads of rain. And do you put on 80, or do you make an adjustment? You go like this. You know, we're back to this again. So how do we do that? So, so that's the next part of this that's going to be very, very different. Very, it's going to emerge you into an, another realm of um, management. But I, I think a very exciting and a very helpful one. So we've been working with a couple of active optical sensors. Lakesh Sharma is my PhD student. He graduated in May. Uh, he's worked mostly with corn, and uh, Hong Gang has worked with other crops. He has a couple of corn plots, but he's also started working with the sunflowers and beets and, and spring wheat as well. So we use two different two different active optical sensors, a green seeker, which was developed by my friend Bill Ron down at Oklahoma State, uh, and then sold to Entech in California and marketed by Trimble, who makes a lot of your GPS units. So so that's who has that system. It's been marketed, but it's been in the market for over 10 years. And then Holland Scientific is a new arrival on the scene, and it was the agronomy behind it is uh, Jim Shepherds, who was a USDA ARS, retired about five years ago and helped an electrical engineer out of um, Lincoln, Nebraska, with this uh, crop circle sensor. They they both work on essentially the same kind of principles. What happens with these is they they shine their own light out, either a red and near infrared or in the wavelengths we call it red edge. It's not in it, near infrared, it's not red, it's in between. Uh, and, it, uh, and it kind of mimics greenness. The red NDVI, which you're most familiar with because that's what the satellites take to help Cargill and the big grain people figure out what you're growing every year. Uh, that's a two-dimensional biomass sensor that gives you kind of an idea of biomass. The, the red edge gives you an idea of greenness, so you use them a little bit different. The red edge is uh, uh, most, most useful when the crop gets taller because the red NDVI, red NDVI has problems as the leaves close together. So for something like uh, trying to estimate if you need post antithesis nitrogen on uh, wheat, for example, you probably want the red edge instead of the red because the red is what we call saturated. All, all the numbers that you get back from it are between 0.9 and 0.99, and so you can't differentiate the, the subtle nuances of treatment differences or the nitrogen differences, but with the red edge, it's, it's more like your eye, and so variations in tint 
make a big deal with that. And so you can use it in the taller crop and it still gives you some good results. Anyway, these are the kind of relationships that we get. This is a uh, green seeker, this is V6. Uh, this is just a 2011, 2012. I've just started plotting through our mountains of data from 2013 and you know, I'll incorporate it back into that. When we get done, we'll have 60, over 60 years, 60 site years of data with these sensors, but it'll be done by late spring and we'll have algorithms by summer. So this term right here, this green seeker 5-6 five, uh, five, leaf NC, the NC is something that something that Bill Ron developed a long time ago uh, to take into account that not everybody is going to sense at exactly the same growth stage. So in order to normalize it, uh, you divide by the growing degree days from the date of planting. So the NC, the NC is an estimate of yield, that's the acronym for that, NC is an estimate of yield. So that is the green seeker reading or the crop circle reading, uh, whatever lenses you choose to use, divided by the growing degree days. And so uh, as when you do that, you're going to be on this line someplace. And so what that's doing, you don't see nitrogen any, anywhere on there, do you? I mean, it's not predicting nitrogen at all. What we're doing is predicting yield. And I'll tell you how that, how that dovetails into nitrogen here in a little bit. But these sensors predict yield. So how do I envision this being used? And, and this is this is how. Let's say that you have a 160 acre field and you decide to do this. When you zone sample and decided what your foundational nitrogen treatment is going to be for your pre-plant, as a person is putting on that foundational treatment on a, on, a, on a small area about the width of the boom, maybe 100 feet long, georeference, you can find it later, you put on maybe 200 pounds of that, higher than you would, or some rate of end that's higher than you would normally do. This is your reference area. So if you determine that this field is a candidate for sidegrass because of the differences you see between the reference and the rest of the field, then the applicator enters, it has the sensor on the front, and it has the array of whatever you're going to sidegrass with on the go, on the back or in front or wherever you <coughs> configure it, and first thing you do is go to the reference strip and you run over that. And that's your reference for that soil that you've selected and that variety. When you do this, you do not split the planter. If you decide to put two varieties in the field, you do the East 80 variety A and the West 80 variety B and you put a reference in each one of those. But you don't split the planter because you've been to field plots. This one's a little lighter green, this one's a little darker green. How in the world are you going to do that? So you put a reference area in each variety and you don't split the planter. So what's happening when you do that? What's happening is embedded in there is the algorithm that you choose in order to put into the put into your rate controller with the NC down here. That's the reading that you're getting from the from the uh, from the sensor divided by the growing degree days. You know, you know what day you planted it, you know the day that you're in the field, you look up end on, you stick the number in, or have it do it automatically, however you decide to do it. And uh, and that's related to the yield. The algorithm relates this to this. And so when you go into the reference, it's going to predict this yield right there using that algorithm. When you get into the field, if your readings, if your NC is within, say, 5% or so of what the reference is, then nothing happens. You've maximized out. Nitrogen is not going to help you push the yield above what the reference yield is. So if it's within 5% or so of what the NC is for the reference, nothing, nothing happens. It just drops across the, the area and it doesn't squirt anything on. But if you're below that, what it's going to do is going to take that lower NC reading and it's going to predict a yield at that, at that area. And that area, the difference between this and this, gives you a yield difference. And this is where the nitrogen comes in on. Because as soon as it sees that yield difference, it will make this calculation at the speed of light, as all good computers do. And it'll take your corn yield difference in pounds an acre and you'll multiply that times 1.25% nitrogen in the grain, which is a good estimate for nitrogen in the grain, doesn't vary that much. And then you divide it by an efficiency factor because any nitrogen you apply is not 100% efficient. And I hope this doesn't come to a great shock for you. Nitrogen is not used 100% efficient in any given year. So, so generally with a, with a side dress application, we, we 
estimate around 60% efficient if you're doing that. So you divide this number by 0.6, and that's your nitrogen rate. The, the unit is estimating yields. When you see the yield difference, then it makes this calculation and makes a nitrogen rate of that. So here's an example. Let's say your reference yield predicts 220 bushels in that area. And then you get out in the field in some area that you've gone over 20, 30 feet or so is uh, estimating around 160 bushels. So the difference is 60 bushels times 56 pounds, that's, sorry, grain per bushel, I'm going to change this someday, 56 pounds of grain per bushel. So the difference is 3,360 pounds of grain, and then that's multiplied times 0.0125, that's the 1.25% N. And so that crop is going to need 42 pounds of N shoved into the plant in order to achieve that higher yield that the reference strip is going to achieve. Divided by the efficiency factor of 0.6, that means that your on-the-go site-specific unit needs to apply 70 pounds of N to that strip. So that's how it'll work, and it'll do that continuously back and forth across the field until the field is done while you're watching over a reruns or something in the cab of the tractor or something. I don't know. But whatever you do in the cab of the tractor, uh, this is going to do that. So these algorithms will be published this summer. That's 2012. <laughs> Season 2013. Okay, so we're going into 2014. People were buying ammonia for $850 and it's $640 roughly. I mean, don't go to the co-op and say, Franzen said I should buy it for $650. But I'm, I'm showing the differences here, okay? These are just estimates right now, and they'll the change a little bit between now and spring, up or down, who knows, you know. So urea, uh, last year about 500, now around 400, UAN last year to 336, it's gone down some, about 280, I suppose everybody's filled now, so they can put any price on it they want. And then uh, MAP, 11.52.0, uh, was around 650, and, uh, and now it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 450, and the same kind of uh, same kind of differences with 10340. Potash has taken a big hit, 550 last year, 425, and ammonium sulfate has gone on quite a little bit too. So what's happening with all this? Well, one of the there's not the only reason, but one of the reasons the prices went up as high as they did on the fertilizer uh, was uh, the crop prices were really high, and there was a huge demand uh, by farmers. You know the question. Going into the fertilizer dealer really wasn't how can I save money this year. You know, if I had an extra ten dollars an acre, what would I spend it on? All right, so this year it's going to be totally different. So how can I how can I save ten bucks an acre on this? And so people will be looking to cut corners, I think, wherever they can because the banks are forcing people to cash flow. You just can't go in and say I grow corn and I'll give you a check. You know, you just you have to say I grow corn and I think I'm going to make this and this is how I'm going to do it. So it'll be a little more complicated, I think, than it was before. So that's part of it. The other part of it is, is that high, the best cure for high prices is high prices. You have really high nitrogen prices, and you have natural gas in the state. All of a sudden, people start thinking about building an ammonia plant here, and an ammonia plant here, and a urea plant here, and a 28% plant here. Do you think this only happened in North Dakota? You know, people are thinking about making an ammonia plant in Iowa, and they're planning, thinking about expanding production on this plant and this plant all over, not only in the United States but all around the world. So the combination of people coming back just a little bit and uh, because of the crop prices going down and there's more people in it and there's uh, you know just a little bit more supply. You know, you, you know on the grain side it doesn't take much difference in supply or you know being a little bit over, a little bit short. I mean people show you 1.5 billion bushels carryover is some huge type deal, and it's really not in the whole scheme of the world, but but because it's higher than it was last year, it means that people aren't willing to pay quite so much for it, and the same with the fertilizer. So the industry, industry though, is, is uh, responding to it. There, there's not as many of them as there are of you, and so they're able to respond, they're much more agile in what they can do. So the potash companies have cut production, and the phosphate companies have cut production, the ammonia plants have slowed down a little bit. So will this get a lot lower than this? I don't really think so. 
don't really think so, because the industry is already responding to all of us. If it happens that there's a very short spring and a lot to do in a very short period of time, then you might see some little bit of uh, enhanced prices as you go into the spring time, but, but generally I think a lot of the cuts, the cuts have already been made. And that the downside of this, I think, is that we're probably close to there. So that's what I think of my big crystal ball. Any questions about this? Anything else? Yeah. The uh, the question was, when you're when you're doing that side dress and using the active optical sensors and using the reference strip, <coughs> what if you had you know different different soils? So the the look out here, the medium texture category uh, covers a lot of ground. But if you have a particularly different soil within there, then you should feel very free in order to uh, do whatever you need to do. Let's say, let's say you have uh, half the field that has a, a kind of a clay loam soil, and then you get into some hilly ground that's maybe sandy loam and even some loamy sand in there. What I would do is I'd put a reference strip out into the higher, you know, the, the the higher clay type soil, darker soil, and a reference strip up in but, but you don't have to do that in every soil type. And the other thing is, uh, many of you deal with areas in the field that sometimes are very substantial that have uh, salt problems. <coughs> and certainly that needs to be soil tested differently. And if your soil test and your history shows that, uh, you know, that it would be crazy to put any more money in that thing, then then you just make sure that whoever is helping you with the map would program that in and it just wouldn't turn off. You don't even have to go across it. So all of those things. What I envision for the, we're going we're to come up with an algorithm for all of this. We're going to come up with an algorithm for Western North Dakota for high clay soils over a high productivity, low clay soils, high clay soils, low productivity, medium textured soils, high and low, different ones for each, and the, an algorithm for long term. No till. Those I envision as starting points for you. That as you go and use this, you may decide to tweak things a little bit, and that's just fine with me. But this is a starting point, a way to get you started, and I think some very good data behind it that will support it.